uh, received her bachelor's from New York University, and then she did a PhD at MIT. At MIT, she studied the nature of habits in non-human primates and monkeys, uh, and that's where I met her. She also developed uh, this remarkable system to record chronically from over a hundred independently movable electrodes in order to get her experiments to work, which was just incredible. She then went on uh, and did a postdoc with David, Badr David Better at Brown, and there she worked on hierarchical task sequences using fMRI and TMS, she was working in humans, as well as uh, worked through all the complexities of getting a wake monkey fMRI to work, uh, and that was a collaboration with David Scheinberg. And so now she started her own lab uh, working on the mechanisms of cognitive sequence control. So the one thing I think is um, really worth emphasizing about Teresa is just the complexity of her experiments. She takes on hard problems and every experiment that she's ever done is more complex than any experiment I've ever done. Like she really just takes it all on. And, and she has a strong belief that the things that she's doing, the things she's tackling, she really needs to tackle these things in order to answer the questions that she's so interested in. So with that, I'm gonna hand things over to Teresa and yeah, please well, help join me in welcoming her. Thank you. Can people hear me? Good, all right, awesome. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Nicole. Yes, I'm, uh, I sh will take this opportunity to say, you know, I've, I'm gonna be here for a little bit longer and it's been wonderful meeting the people I've met so far. So thank you very much for having me. And if any point you have questions, there are some more complicated tasks that hopefully I will explain to you well here. But if you have questions, please uh, feel free to ask. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit today about cognitive sequences and some parallel dynamics we've found across species in monkeys and humans. There we go. All right. So complex behavior depends on sequences. And first, I'll just introduce the concept of cognitive control. I'm going to talk to you about cognitive sequences. It's the ability to select actions based on your goals and plans. And you can flexibly adapt behaviors. And importantly, these behaviors evolve through time. So this is where the notion of sequence comes in. And just as a few examples, sequences can range from just about anything, you know, whether it be playing or grooming or noodling around on your phone, all of those things involve sequences. And what I hope to show you today is that, you know, monkeys have those sequences too. In fact, even noodling on your phone. And for anybody curious, this is not a dolly image, this is real. <laughs> Um, all right, so probably one thing that popped into your head when you first heard the word sequences was this distinction between automatic and controlled behavior. And so automatic behaviors, they're fast, they can be without thought, but they're often fixed. Whereas controlled behaviors are slow, deliberative, but they have the advantage of being flexible. In a cartoon version of where you might find these in the brain, you think about control as being localized in the frontal cortex, perhaps, and as automatic behaviors potentially localized in subcortical structures like the basal ganglia. But we know that the picture is more complicated than that, that in reality, you have both of them in this complex interplay. And I hope to tell you a little bit today about how we're thinking about these more controlled behaviors and then working towards thinking about how they intersect with the more automatic ones. So to give you a more concrete example of these behaviors, I'd like to take an example that probably many of you are familiar with, which is making a cup of coffee or a cup of tea. And we'll call that your goal to caffeinate yourself. And then you can break that down into a series of sub goals preparing your coffee, the machine, et cetera. And then you can break that down into a series of abstract tasks, such as grinding the beans, scooping the grounds, and then getting everything into the coffee maker. And you can break that down further into a series of motor sequences. And probably a lot of people, when you think about sequences, you might think about sequences on this level, on the motor level. And I'm interested in sequences here 
in the abstract task level. And the important distinction there is that they're not necessarily contingent on the precise motor actions that are happening. So for example, if somebody put the coffee beans in a different place or put the milk in a different place, that's not gonna stop you from executing this more abstract sequence that you're doing. Versus if you, for example, play an instrument, if somebody rearranged the keys on you, that would absolutely prevent you from playing your song. So how do we start to break this down? So we perform these sequences every day. They seem easy to us as we do them, but they're complicated. So the way I think about it is sequences as being a series of states. I know state is a loaded word. So here I'm just using it to indicate a series of steps. They have an order, there's a beginning and an end, and they have to be executed in this order. And as a way of illustrating the fact that these more abstract sequences are a thing unto themselves, for example, patients with frontal lobe damage, a common complaint is that they can't do these kinds of simple sequences that we do every day. They can't make their own breakfast. If you sit them down in a lab and you ask them to do a task that involves executive function, they can do it just fine. But at home, they can't keep track of these easy things that we do all the time. So how do we study this in the lab? And this has foundations in my work, both as a PhD and a graduate student. So we use monkeys, which of course have complex behaviors, sequential behaviors, we record from them. We use humans who of course also have complex behaviors. Uh, we do fMRI and TMS, and our most recent venture is to do fMRI in monkeys as well, and really try to get away from just looking at behavioral analogy across the species and really thinking about the functional homology, particularly in these more complex and cognitive tasks. So just a quick overview of what I'll tell you about today. Um, first, I'll tell you about controlling task sequences in humans and a novel dynamic that we found while people are doing this. And then try to break that down in terms of what that dynamic is potentially about and what makes that dynamic and what pushes around that dynamic. And then towards the end, I'll tell you a little bit more about our more recent monkey work where we are scanning monkeys and trying to bring this into another species. Okay, so just quick reminder that we're thinking about tasks up here at this abstract task level. So how do we do this in a lab? How do you create one of these abstract sequences? Well, in this task, it's pretty simple for people to do. On every trial, they see a shape. It's red or blue, circle or square, and they just have to just categorize it according to its color or its shape. Um, and that's it. Pretty simple. Where sequence comes into play is that on every trial, people are instructed a particular sequence. In this case, color, shape, shape, color. So what that means is when that shape comes up, they have to remember, oh, I'm supposed to be deciding the color on this trial, in which case they would press one here because it's red. In the next trial, they have to remember, oh, it's shape. Therefore, I have to press two because it's a square. And this is the task that they're doing. Just as a side note, I'm showing you different sizes of stimuli that's irrelevant here. It's just so we had a little bit more variety in what people were looking at. And so through the- Oh, so that, that is just indicating the fact that they could respond one for either red or circle. So it's for both. Yes, thank you. Thank you for asking. So when we ask people to do this, we do, they do it over the course of a block. They're doing these sequences back to back. And why this is important is because what that creates is this internal sequence boundary. We're not cueing people as to where they are in the sequence at all. So they have to keep track of where they are in the sequence themselves. And we do two different kinds of sequences with the people. The first one we call simple. If you generalize color and shape to A's and B's, it's in the format A, A, B, B. And in other words, color, color, shape, shape. And we call it simple because there's only one task switch, only one place where you're going from color to shape or shape to color in the internal portion of the sequence. We also have a complex sequence like color, shape, shape, color, where there are two switches in the internal. Importantly, when you string them together, that first position of the simple sequence is also a switch. So the number of switches and repeats are balanced across the two different kinds. 
So first I wanna convince you that these people are actually doing this task as sequences. And this is the behavior. So there's a few features here to point out. I'm taking the reaction times across the four positions in the sequence, and then the two different kinds of sequences, the complex sequence and the simple sequence in blue. So the first thing you'll probably notice is that you get increased reaction times at the task switches, and that's you have to switch from one thing to another. So we would expect that. And that's in comparison to the faster reaction times on the task repeats. Now, you also probably notice that this first position is special, that you get an increased reaction time here. And that's actually indicative of the sequence initiation processes that are going, because it's over and above what you would expect if people were just switching back and forth between the tasks. So to illustrate that, for example, in the complex sequence, if you were just going back and forth between doing color and shape, that first position would actually have very fast reaction times because it's actually a task repeat. So we use this sequence initiation as an indicator of the fact that people are thinking of this construct as a sequence. So just to orient you, if you're not used to looking at people inflated brains, um, we're interested in this area here along the middle frontal gyrus and the more rostral portion of it. And we're interested in area, the rostral lateral prefrontal cortex. And the reason why we're interested in that is because when you think about executive function more generally, there's been work that shows that if you think about things in a hierarchical manner in terms of what is doing that uppermost goal setting and decision making, it's this area of the brain. And so our question really started out with, well, what if that context, that upper level context is evolving through time? What if it is the sequence itself? What would we see in this region? And so this is our region of interest. Now, if you take a slice through, this is left osteolateral prefrontal cortex. And what we see is people are doing this task in bold, in fMRI, is that as you go through the sequence positions, you get this ramp up in activation as you go. And if you look in the whole brain for all the areas that do this ramping, RLPFC is not alone, but it's pretty discreet. Okay? And so I'm not, I'm focusing here on RLPFC, but I want to acknowledge the fact that there is a network of areas that are doing. So just to convince you that it's not, the fact that anything involved in sequence shows this ramping dynamic. There are other sequential properties that are captured here. Um, I want to show you this area, which is pre-premotor dorsal, mouthful of a name, also overlaps with Broca's area. It shows a different kind of sequential property, and that is dissociating between the two different kinds of sequences. And that's important because the only thing that separates those two sequences is really the fact that you have an internal boundary there. So this is not picking up on some lower level dynamics that are more switches than repeats. It is actually caring about the sequential property itself. And that is pretty unique as an area in terms of reflecting that. So we see different sequential properties reflected differently. So naturally the first question that we had was, well, okay, this ramping is cool, but what is it for? Right. Is it necessary? Do you actually need it to be doing the task or is it a byproduct of one of the other areas that's maybe showing that dynamic? Is it carrying out the sequence itself? If it was, you might think it would be necessary throughout the sequence and not maybe just at particular points. Or could it be needed for some sort of more transient involvement? For example, when you need to check on something when uncertainty increases. So what do I mean by that? Well. If you go back to this idea of the fact that you're transitioning through a series of states, you could imagine that as you go through those transitions, so color, color, shape, shape, each time you transition from one state to the next, you might have a little bit more uncertainty of where you are in that sequence because we're not giving people external cues as far as where they are in those sequences. So these were a couple of the ideas that we were going in with as we were trying to figure out what is this dynamic for? So the way that we approached this first was by doing a TMS experiment, transcranial magnetic stimulation, non-invasive humans. And we used the exact same task that I just showed you. And what we did was stimulate a single pulse in between when the stimulus turned on and before people made their decision. And we did this such that we only stimulated at most once every group of four items. 
people were still doing this without external indicators. I'm just putting these dots here so you can visually see that, you know, we would stimulate once in the second position and then the fourth position and so on throughout the experiment. We also, and so the, we're stimulating here in the RLPFC and the pre-PMB. And what we also did is we weren't sure exactly when would be the most relevant. And something that's really nice about TMS is that you still have that temporal precision that you get from a lot of stimulation experiments. So we had 10 different stimulus onset asynchronies that we looked at in the course of this experiment too. And the first thing that we found is if we look across everything is that earlier has a greater effect in the rostrolateral prefrontal cortex. And in this other sequential area that's more posterior has a greater effect later in the stimulation period. Yes. Is that earlier in a given sequence or earlier for a particular item within the sequence? Earlier for a given item. So this this what I'm showing you here is collapsed across the sequence positions. Okay. So this was interesting to us because it aligns uh, nicely with the idea that perhaps there's a flow of information from more abstract to less abstract as you go from rostral to caudal. And this is maybe nodding towards that kind of an organization. So then, of course, the question is, well, what happens across the sequence? And so here, I'm collapsing across the middle position just because we have all those SOA, and we were really most interested in what was going on at the beginning and the end. So RLPFC, and what I'm showing you is the difference between stimulation and non-stimulation. And this orange line is RLPFC. And what we see is that there's an increase in errors as you get later in the sequence itself, recapitulating that same kind of ramping dynamic that we were seeing, that it seems like this area is not only necessary in the fact that people make errors if you disrupt activity there, but you also have an increasing engagement of this area or increasing errors that are caused as you go through and simulate. And that's in contrast to this other sequence related area pre-PMD where we saw the opposite pattern essentially. So we weren't necessarily expecting this when we saw this. So we actually went through and did the whole thing again. And this time we added on this area, rostral medial prefrontal cortex. The reason why we added it on is because there's a physical sensation to TMS. And we wanted to make sure that we were stimulating somewhere very close by, but in a different network, such that we could account for the physical sensation of the simulation. And what we see is we get basically the same thing again, where we see this increasing pattern of errors in RLPFC. This green line here is RMPFC, which isn't statistically different than zero. And then this slight decrease in pre-PMD. So what do we take from this? We saw this dynamic that we see this ramping activation as you go through, as people go through the sequence. It's necessary, people make more errors if you stimulate while they are trying to do this. And we came away from this with the idea that perhaps what RLPFC is doing is transiently checking while tasks are ongoing to kind of keep you on track. And it's part of a broader network. And it brings the idea that perhaps what is going on with those who have deficits is that if you're disrupting this checking system, maybe people can no longer keep track anymore of what they're doing. And that's maybe one of the reasons why frontal patients have these sorts of deficits. Okay. So now what we wanna go for is what kinds of computations could potentially be underlying this dynamic? And a couple of the, the first ideas that we had that it was related to either uncertainty or monitoring. So what do I mean that, by that? Well, just to bring us back to our copy making example here, where we have these abstract tasks, you can think about these three features in the context of copy making. In, when I say uncertainty, I mean maybe position uncertainty in terms of where you are in the sequence. Did I add the sugar? Very critical thing to know if you add sugar in your coffee. Um, what about monitoring without position cues from memory? I'm stirring, but I can't see what I'm stirring. And then monitoring without multi-level decision making. You just have to scoop the grounds. You're not actually trying to keep track of the rest of it. So those are the features that we're gonna look at first. So how do we go about manipulating uncertainty in this particular task? 
So it's basically the same task as what I showed you before with one change. And that is the fact that we have these very occasional clue trials. And these clue trials are a little bit of information for the participant in that, for example, here there's a green circle. Green is not a potential answer. So therefore it tells them that they should be answering for shape because it's just not possible to answer that this thing is green. Similarly for the triangle, there is no answer triangle. So they would have to be answering for color. Okay, so this is our behavior again, the four positions, the reaction time. Again, we see this increase at the first position convincing us that people are actually doing this task as a, as a sequence. And you can't see it here, but there's actually dashed lines here that are kind of hiding underneath there. The reaction times aren't different between those clue trials and non-clue trials. But importantly, the error rates are different. So people do better when they have a little bit of information. They make fewer errors. This is good. People are doing what we want. So first question, do we see ramping in this task? We've changed a couple of things. Is it there? Yes, we get ramping in RLPFC. Great. Does the brain respond to clues? Are people making use of this? Yes, we see activity. Great. All right. So our crucial question. Do clues change ramping? No. So this is, I'm showing you here, the amount of ramping activation that we can account for with just a simple linear increase. And we see that there's essentially no difference between clues and no clues. And in fact, it maybe even trends in the opposite direction from what we might have predicted if it really had something to do with uncertainty. Okay. so. At least in this particular def, there's a lot of definitions of uncertainty for sure, but at least in this way of approaching the idea of uncertainty, um, it does not appear that this dynamic is involved with uncertainty. But we did learn that it's robust to stimulus perturbations. So changing that stimulus every so often didn't throw off this dynamic. Okay, so the next two questions. What about, do you have to be monitoring it from memory? I told you that we didn't give people information about where they were in the sequence. Is that important for engaging this area? And what about if I take away this complex multi-level decision-making? I'm making you remember the fact that you have to make a particular judgment, and then you have to make a particular response based on that stimulus. What if I take that multi-level decision-making away? So the way we did this is with a very simple sequence monitoring task. We showed people a series of objects and they had to remember the order. So for example, in every trial, this is a phone for those of you who haven't seen one in real life. Um, for this, you just have to, if the item is in sequence, you hold down the button, that's all. And if it's out of sequence, you release the button. That's all you had to do. And so it sets up like this, where the first four stimuli are your instruction of the things to remember. So phone, flag, speaker, accordion, the stimuli come along. And then at the end, you either hold the button down or you release it. In this case, if you were paying attention, then you would know that that phone is out of order. You release the button and you would get the trial correct. You have a check mark for that, or you get an X if you mixed it. That's all people had to do. That's the visible version of the task. We also ask people to do what we call an occluded version of the task, where rather than people seeing these objects, they see a placeholder image. So in this case, a set of cards, they have the same four stimuli turn, um, instructing them in the beginning. And then they see this placeholder image one by one by one until the final image when they have to make a decision of, is that item in sequence or out of sequence? Okay. So just to show you the behavior again, there's the reaction times on this task of that final release. People are tracking this information sequentially. We get this increase in reaction time at the first position. Um, and then these are the error rates. People do do a little worse, um, but importantly, people uh, are the same at detecting the objects across. So even though their performance is a little worse. First question, do we see ramping in this task? Is it the case that when we're just seeing a series of objects, this area is engaged? And the answer is yes, we do. Maybe a little bit, tiny bit more posterior than in the other tasks, um, but it's there. So this is really interesting because people think about this part of the brain as being 
involved in really complex processing. And here we're seeing something that's actually relatively simple that we see this part of the brain being engaged in with the specific dynamics that we saw before associated with these much more abstract sequences. So then the question is, do you need to be monitoring it for memory? And so this is this region here that I'm showing you now. And the answer is no, you don't. So even if you can see the objects, even if you have a perfect placeholder of where you are in the sequence, that area will be engaged with these dynamics. There's no difference between these two dots. And just to show you this task sequence area, which is the region of interest from our first experiment, there's basically no difference between that, maybe a little less activity. And this is, again, maybe related to this rostral caudal gradient of more complex, more abstract to less abstract. But um, the basic take home is that you don't need to be monitoring these things from memory in order to see these kinds of dynamics. Okay, so you get ramping in RLPFC with and without cues. And importantly, you can also get this without multi level decision making. So it really speaks to this area um, being robust and really caring about sequential information of all different kinds and tracking it through time. And just to show you all of those regions that we came up with across those three experiments, they actually line up pretty nicely in the same region. So it really feels like we're looking at the same thing here across these experiments. So now I'm gonna switch gears a little bit to thinking about what potentially pushes this dynamic around? What's modulating it? And in the experiments that I just showed you, there was this implicit notion of, of goal, and that is the experimenter asked you to do something. What if I now explicitly modulate what that goal is? Okay. And probably when I started talking about ramping, you might've had other different kinds of ramping from other species come to mind. And so I've been telling you about this ramping in bold in humans, but it's been observed all over the brain for all sorts of different reasons. And including, for example, in rat medial prefrontal neurons and in rat striatal dopamine concentrations. And just to give you a sense of the kind of signals that I'm thinking about, importantly, there's classic work and, of course, work continuing now showing that this has to do with sensory evidence accumulation. This is not what I'm thinking of here. And there's some actually really beautiful human work showing that if you just look at where in the human brain shows evidence of sensory accumulation, um, that this area in the rostral lateral prefrontal cortex is not one of those regions that's involved in that. So this is a little different from that kind of a dynamic. So how do we think about modulating the goal in the context of, of what I've been telling you about? Well, okay, what if we, for example, it's leading up to getting your tasty cup of coffee? And Maybe that cup of coffee is Starbucks. Now, some people like Starbucks, some people might not like Starbucks, but there's a chance that if I change that goal, if I change that cup of coffee to maybe elixir coffee, did I get it right? Do people like elixir coffee? Yes, maybe? Okay, good. <laughs> then your response is potentially gonna be different regardless. And, and so that's explicitly what we're trying to modulate here is what is that end goal of what you're doing? And you could imagine a couple of different ways in which that would happen. One is that you might get a change in the slope. And another is that you might get this overall increase in activity. And there's lots of things in between, but those are the kind of the two basic things that we were going in. So the way we did this is with the exact same sequence monitoring task that we were using before. But then we modulated the value of the sequence, essentially. What do you get if you complete it? And so we had low value sequences, and this just translated into the amount of money that people got on the, when they were done the experiment. And that was indicated with a single dollar sign, both in the beginning and the end, or we had a high value sequences, and that's three dollar sign in the beginning and the end. And so the first question is, do we see ramping? Let's just make sure we're self-replicating. It's good. Yes, we see ramping in the RLPFC. Great. And then, is it modulated by goal and reward? And to think about the potential ways in which this could happen, we turned to thinking about the animal work a little bit more and how this dynamic plays out if you're looking at a rat that's running a maze, which you could think about as being sequenced. And 
dopamine, there's of course dopamine projections to the prefrontal cortex. So there's a, it could be involved in that level as well. And what they saw was if you have high reward, which is this light green, then you see this increasing ramp that goes throughout. If you have low reward, which is dark green, you might see this increase in the beginning, but then it drops off toward the end. So the question is, do we see some mix of these kinds of dynamics here in the people when we're looking at both? So again, we have the same region of interest in the RLPFC. And this is what we see. I'm now showing you two consecutive sequences that people executed. And so high reward in red, low reward in blue, what we see is there's, there is this ramping increase over the first group of four trials, the first sequence. And then as you get towards the end, as you get towards that goal, it really does look like it bifurcates very similarly as to what's been seen in dopamine. Now, of course, we have no idea that this is directly related here because we're looking at both, but we think this is interesting in the fact that, so yes, these dynamics are modulated by goal, but maybe more only so as the goal becomes more relevant as you get closer to that goal. And this area is potentially then integrating that information then. Okay, so the answer is yes, goal does modulate it, but it's complicated. It's not straightforward. It's not just, for example, an overall net increase in the area activity. So now I'm going to transition to talking about, okay, how do we start to think about bringing these kinds of concepts into the model? And, you know, I've, I've given you a lot of information about these high level sequences. And I really want to start to think about how can we get the monkeys performing the same kinds of tasks as what we're doing with humans and really start to test the actual functional homology when it comes to these really prefrontal areas and thinking about these dynamics, and then of course, moving on to the neural recordings to actually see the physiological base. So how do we get there? I've shown you, hopefully convinced you for this strong role of human rostrolateral prefrontal cortex. Do monkeys have any sort of equivalent here? And so a place to start is DLPFC, and I'll show you why. So first we have electrophysiology evidence from many experience, experiments that have gone before, where you see serial position tuning during motor and visual sequences. So lots of evidence that points to the fact that you have sequential information being coded there. You also have lots of non-sequential abstract rule representation that's been seen there. So it really feels like when you put together this notion of abstract and of sequence, that that could be the place that you would see it. And then of course you can think about the anatomy. So no conversation about anatomical homology would be complete with about Talk, without talking about Petridis and Panda's landmark work to try and really map out the anatomical similarity here. The important thing that this doesn't take account for though is it doesn't say anything about are these areas doing anything functionally the same, right? This just speaks to what the cells look like. And so some really interesting great work in uh, Rushworth's lab recently has tried to look at the functional connections and where at least functionally speaking, not necessarily um, in doing tasks, but looking at the connectivity, functional connectivity, we see that this area in last lateral, rostrolateral prefrontal cortex in humans, which is this maroon blob here, actually has similar connectivity to this area that's right around the principal sulcus in dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. And that's unique to this very lateral rostral area in humans that it shows up here. A lot of the other areas, they would, they have the same sort of functional connectivity that you would expect from the similar area that's named the same thing. So monkey area 46 actually seems to be the most similar in terms of functional connectivity to human rostral lateral prefrontal cortex. So that's where we're starting. So we're going in with two main questions to start with. Does monkey area 46 represent abstract visual sequences? Is there a representation there at all? And are there sequence related ramping dynamics in area 46? Two very basic things. And so we tried to answer, and this goes to Nicole's wonderful introduction with the simplest sequence tracking monitoring task that we could come up with. I say simple in quotes here because of course nothing with monkeys is ever simple. 
Um, and of course, in retrospect, we realized that this task was maybe not as simple uh, either, despite our best efforts, but let me tell you more. So we have monkeys in a scanner. They're in the Sphinx position in a 3T machine that humans use as well. And I want to credit this drawing to my, I was about to say graduate student. She actually just graduated two days ago. So now Dr. Yusef Rodriguez, who's our uh, artist in residence, so to speak, in the lab. This is one of our actual monkeys that she drew in the scanner. Um, and what the monkeys are doing is they are simply fixating. This is a no report task. And they're fixating while they see a stream of fractal images go by. And these fractals are arranged into particular sequential patterns. So in this case, the pattern is same, 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 different. And so we mix up the images that make up these particular sequences such that we're drawing from a pool of what we call habituation images, where we're just showing them that same rule over and over again. And then we expose them to rare deviants. And the deviants come in a few different forms. So there's our habituation. First kind of deviant is new items with the same rule. So follows the same, same, same different, but just drawing from this deviant pool. Then we have rule deviants. So that in this case, this is four of the same. And then we have number deviants that are either two and six items. And then of course we have the double deviant. And those are laid out in a run. And I know there's a, a lot here, but basically the idea is the first block monkeys are just gonna be seeing those images that are coming from the habituation pool, following the rule that we want to establish. And then in subsequent blocks, we're going to pick one of these deviants and only six out of the 30 sequences they see will be that deviant. So deviants are pretty rare. All the while monkeys are getting rewarded, but importantly, they're not getting rewarded in a manner that's actually tied to the sequence. They're getting rewarded for the amount of time that they're fixating. So the longer they fixate, the more reward they get. So we've decorrelated the notion of reward from the sequences that they're seeing. So first, what we're going to do is we're going to, of course, the monkeys are doing a no report task. So we first want to know, are they actually attending to these sequences? And we're going to use the deviant responses as an index into that. Are they attending to the sequences? And the two comparisons we're going to make are rule deviance versus new item same rule and number deviance versus new item same rule. And the important thing about this comparison is that these are all rare images that we're comparing. So we're accounting for the fact that they're seeing some of these images less. So we're not looking at first level oddball responses, for example, here, we're looking only at responses that are gonna come from the, from the break in the rule being observed. And the two areas that we're gonna be looking at are left and right area 46. Um, these coordinates came directly from that paper that localized the bit of cortex that seemed to have the most similar connectivity to human rostral lateral prefrontal cortex. And what we see here is that the difference to new items between new items the same rule and the rule deviant is significantly different here in the right area of 46. Not quite significant in the left, but the two areas are not statistically different from each other. So maybe just a little bit more biased towards one side. Good, okay. Now, did I just cherry pick that area? Is it the whole brain that's responding to this? Well, I have to show you the whole brain in order to convince you that that's not true. So I'm looking at the same two contrasts now, whole brain contrast, three monkeys. And what we see is for rule deviance, it's really pretty specific that you get this spot in DLPFC and a couple of other places. And then we also see very similar things, slightly different in the other places, but very consistently in dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And importantly, when you overlay these two, the only cluster that survives is this area in DLPFC that's responding to both kinds of rule breaks. So not only is it showing responses to abstract visual sequences, but it seems to be showing these responses in a more general way, in that it's responding to both a rule break and a number break. Okay, so next question now, do we actually see these kinds of ramping dynamics that we saw in the human? And we're gonna use a similar model of ramping dynamics, just a simple linear increase, that's what we're looking for. And 
we have the same sort of idea here in the sense that if ramping dynamics are associated with the sequences, if we break the sequential rule, do we see a change in these ramping dynamics? So we're again looking at this rule deviant compared to new items in the same rule and number deviant compared to new items in the same rule. Same two ROIs. And what we see here is that, yes, we do see significant differences in ramping responses in area 46. Um, this time, it seems like it's more on the left, but these two are not statistically different from each other. So I can't really say much about the latter out. And then again, to show you the whole brain, to convince you that I'm not just picking out this spot, it seems very specific again to DLPFC and a couple of other places in terms of looking at ramping in the whole brain. And maybe not surprisingly from looking at the ROIs, we don't see it on the right here. Okay, so what have we learned? So we had two main questions. Does monkey area 46 represent abstract visual sequences? Yes, so you can say that it does. Are there sequence related ramping dynamics here? Yes, I would argue that there are. So there's potentially an interesting twist where you might have maybe different dynamics across the hemispheres, but importantly, they're both showing a response to the change in the abstract visual sequence. There just might be a leaning on more one side or the other side in terms of what dynamic is being used to represent that. We don't have enough to be able to pull that apart here, but that's definitely a future direction for us. Interestingly, it could be consistent with the fact that we do have a left bias in the humans where we see ramping more on the left in humans than on the right. Okay, so in this last little bit here, I'm gonna give you a little bit of a teaser, a trailer of coming attractions, so to speak, in terms of now we are recording from these areas that we localize with fMRI. Um, so here is inflated monkey brain, and I know they're a little hard to see, so my apologies. There are these little red dots here. This is one particular animal's contrast with a threshold dropped way down, and then these little red dots are the recording locations that we've targeted thus far. Um, this is just a slice through to give you a little bit better view, and we're recording with the probes in order to do this. Just to give you a sense of the population of cells that we're looking at so far, we're in the middle of analysis to say the least, um, but we have about 23% of our cells that respond to a difference in sequence type. So for example, uh, deviant versus a new item, same rule, and about 7% of our cells thus far that respond, have responses to ordinal positions. And so what I'm, the one thing that I will show you that is uh, tantalizing to me is we've just picked out the cells that have a greater response to rule deviance than to new items of the same rule. And I'm showing you this over the course of the four positions in the sequence. And so the first thing that I'll point out here that is very interesting to us is that we have a separation between rule deviant and new items of the same rule throughout all four sequence positions. And the interesting thing there is that unless the monkey is keeping track of the general context of which block it's in, you wouldn't see this difference at any position other than the last position, because that's actually the position where those two sequences would differ the most. So the fact that we see the separation throughout the sequence means that there is there has to be some sort of abstract representation of what the monkey is doing and keeping track of that more abstract context. Now, I'm just showing you little windows around these stimuli. What if I show you the rest of what's going on there? Well, I think probably all of you who have looked at these signals before will pick up right away that there are some really interesting modulations in firing rate that are going on. There's, I'm showing you firing rates here. We have LFPs, we have not dove into them yet, but it looks like that there could be some really interesting dynamics in these points, and maybe there could be a trade-off between what's going on in the LFPs and what's happening to the firing rate. And the other thing is that there seems to be this, this increased anticipation, perhaps, of the fourth item in the sequence. Um, so I think all of this is just pointing us towards we have lots more to learn here, but there's, there's for certain a lot of interesting things that we are excited to dive into with these recordings. So just to wrap up, quick summary of what I've talked about today. 
talked about controlling task sequences and the fact that rostrolateral prefrontal cortex is necessary to do this in the humans. And that in terms of what underlies this dynamic, it's very robust and you don't necessarily need to monitor from memory or some sort of complex task in order to do so. It's modulated by goal and reward, but perhaps only at the end. And in thinking about the monkeys now, it really seems like there is an analogous area in monkey area 46 that responds to abstract visual sequences and that electrophysiology is soon to come. So that I will say thank you and mention that I am looking for postdocs to grow our team. And um, Arit and Nadira actually just graduated this past week. So grad students too. Thank you. Any multivariate analysis? Because you might imagine if you some of the pattern of activity within these areas is going to reflect more details about the exact details of the analysis. Yes, yes. Uh, very actively on our list. We have not gotten to it yet, but yes. Um, I think there's lots of depth there that we just haven't scratched the surface of. I've looked at it a little bit with some of my earlier work, um, but yeah. We're particularly excited to look at it in the monkey work, um, for sure. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Uh, unless I'm mistaken, they couldn't have an argument for the joint of the cortical result, but the analogy with the PAL finding is to wonder what can be done on. Sure, sure, sure. I mean, if you look there and if there are similar where. Right, so uh, you're, you're absolutely right. We have looked there. Um, yeah, I was showing you mostly cortical views, but we have that in our contrast. There is ramping in the striatum. Um, of course, we don't know if the result of the ramping in the humans is potentially dopamine dynamics. It's fun to think about, um, but there are certainly dynamics there that would make us think it could be related. Um, VTA is notoriously difficult to see in whole brain contrasts. Um, but we do see ramping in VTA if we look, if we do small volume correction. So that is also there. So I think there's lots more to follow up on in terms of different involvement in, in this, for sure. Yeah, sure. Uh, this is the fun part. Um, so there's been some really lovely computational work that basically shows that um, these unit, very simple univariate um, gradual increasing things can be really good at as a marker for where you are essentially, because you have the capacity to uniquely mark wherever you are, however you are. Um, and so what I think this is, and you can think about it, of course, in terms of pools of neurons, I, I doubt very highly that these are single neurons that have these individual dynamics, but you know, networks of neurons that are progressively becoming more engaged, that you have different networks that are potentially of different sizes as you mark, um, but that it's really providing a scaffolding on which you could keep track of some pretty complex processes that generalizes across a bunch of different functions. Um, and so I know that's a little hand wavy, but that, that's, that's our general conception right now. And the, those are the kinds of ideas we're going in with as we start to look at the physiology, both in terms of trying to understand is what we're seeing at individual places in the sequence a function of the activity, only a function of what's come before, or is there some sort of more general representation that there's an association with, for example, position in the sequence that's in, independent of an invariant for what the individual stimuli are, those are the kinds of things we're starting with. Yeah. Question online that I have to be asked to see the summary. Oh, sure. 
chat. Let's give Teresa a big thanks for coming in. Yeah.